Hey family, so I was listening to a Lisa Cabrera um, <clears throat> video, and um, this man who wore this White Lives Matter 2 shirt referenced Dr. King's dream. It always, when I hear stuff like this, by the way, I always wonder if it's a news plant sometimes, because um, the mainstream, the white mainstream, their biggest go-to, their their most frequent go-to when it comes to race matters is Dr. King's um, dream speech. Here's the interesting thing, and I was reminded of this um, by Dave Emery recently. I was reading a piece about Dr. King's assassination on his website, Spitfire. Now, I may not agree with a lot of things that is on that website, but his coverage of Dr. King's assassination over the last 30 plus years has been really good. So I give him credit for that. Um, <clears throat> but he read a excerpt from a book. Let me get the book because I actually have it. All right, I'm back. So he read an ex excerpt from this book, Orders to Kill. Um, and basically what the excerpt says is that the fact that Dr. King was killed in the United States, a man who supposedly represented all of the good qualities of this society, represented all of the good qualities even of um, the Christian faith, which so many white people subscribe to, the fact that he was killed and murdered says something about the society. And ultimately, I say, says something about the um, culture. Dr. King's death, I believe, is on par with the death of Jesus in the Bible. Why? Because Dr. King is, or was, should I say, the type of black man that white people say that, you know, is the ideal black man. That's the ideal black man. And the fact that we as black folks haven't put that together. See, we think... We think that white people <clears throat> like Dr. King because he was selling out black folks. And they hate Malcolm X because Malcolm X wasn't selling out black folks. But the fact is, Malcolm X was far too radical for white people. They have said, they had said, and they continue to say that a person like Dr. King is much more preferable because he's <clears throat> articulate, he's intelligent, and pretty much he has accepted um white mannerisms and education into his lexicon and uses that lexicon then to um, try to win over white people. And yet he was killed. And not only was he killed, but many, many, many white people at the time, not less than a majority, by the way, they celebrated his death, should I say. Um, I was just recently listening to, I can't remember. I think, I can't remember who I was listening to, but I was listening to a white dude talk about this. And um, he was a kid when Dr. King was assassinated. And he remembered his, he lived in New York State, in central New York. And when um, his father got home uh, the day, the night that Dr. King was assassinated, um, he was told, he got out of his car and like the, the, the community was celebrating, the white community was celebrating. And he was like, what's going on? And um, one of the white people said, you know, oh, that SOB N-word, Dr. King, is no more. He got his effing head blown off. It says something about the society. Anyway, um, about Dr. King's dream, because he gave his I Have a Dream speech. And, you know, again, the reference of the mainstream media is... Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech in 1963. That was his pinnacle. And then stuff happened, stuff happened, stuff happened. Dead. No. Uh-uh. That wasn't what happened. Dr. King's dream hit reality almost immediately. Almost immediately. And he referenced it. By the summer, by the late summer of um 1964, he had written several op-ed pieces in the Chicago Defender, New York Times, various other places, 
where he was referencing his dream and questioning if his dream has turned into a nightmare. When he started tackling northern poverty, particularly ghetto poverty that impacted black people, he was he began to be hated by the northern liberal elite. And that caused him really I mean the man really um began to circle despair when that happened. I want to show you something. All right, I'm back. So years ago, <clears throat> I um, contacted the Library of Congress. I was doing some research and I came across um, the, a record of a statement Dr. King had given in front of a selected House committee. I was I knew that there had to be a transcript. So my question was, can I get a hold of the transcript? So I contacted the con the um, Library of Congress. Um, it took me a minute to actually get to a person to be able to talk to. And lo and behold, they sent me a PDF uh, link to the statement. I then spent, a, um, you know, every free moment that I could over to come over the next like three days transcribing from the pdf because it wouldn't let me save it to a hard copy so i would have it this is what i transcribed when i talk about dr king coming into reality this is really this underscores what i'm talking about him coming into reality this is the statement and related comments of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. given to the Subcommittee on Executive Reorganization Committee on Government Operations, U.S. Senate, Washington, D.C., Thursday, December 15, 1966. Dr. King, when he was sitting in front of the subcommittee, was sitting in front of the subcommittee with RFK, Robert Kennedy Jr. He talked This is not the one that I wanted. I wanted the other one. But he talked about the poverty. Um, and by the other one, I meant I hadn't marked this one up. But the other one, um, uh, which I used to transcribe from, was a photograph of each page. Um, but I marked the other one up. Uh, he talked about the poverty that he witnessed in the black community in 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 the urban setting, which he lived in for a time. Um, uh, I think it was in Ohio. And it was it was maddening to him. Um, and he saw stuff occurring that was powerful. I mean, like he said, he he literally could witness these clouds of inferiority forming in his kids minds. I, he talked, it, it, this is a fascinating read, ladies and gentlemen. It is something that should be well known. And I was surprised. I asked if they had photo, um, if they had video evidence of this or audio and evidence. And they said they didn't, but maybe in some archive they do. Um, Dr. King's dream, when you, they, the media, in the King family, the media, more so than the King family, I think because the media misuses his stuff, um, they have really hidden away what Dr. King did post-64. They have really hidden away what Dr. King did post-64. Um, there is a video that I have put up on my channel of a speech that Dr. King gave um and it's called The Summer of Our Discontent. He actually used it in one that speech as a chapter in one of his books. And um, that seeks to talk about why there were riots in 64. Why it made sense. The media has hidden away what Dr. King did post 64 completely we don't talk about it 
you know, everyone hears the um statement recently, the riot is the language of the unheard. They don't realize <clears throat> that that statement could have come from 65, 66, or 67 because he made it several times. He made it several times. The dream, <clears throat> by the time 1968 was well into existence and <clears throat> he was moving towards the Poor People's Campaign, he told Dick Gregory that he feared that black people were integrating into a burning house. He went in five years, in less than five years, he went from, I have a dream that we can live this way, we can be this way, we can blah, 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 to stating that he believes black people are integrating into a burning house. What does that mean? That means that he, he saw white society as so corrupt and messed up that it was going to destroy black folks if they integrated into it. That is a powerful recognition. His last speech that he gave that everybody likes to play. White white folks have been playing with y'all, black people. Because they'll play the last part and they'll claim the last part. <clears throat> but black folks, you ain't listening to it. And you don't know the background to it. The last speech that Dr. King gave where he said, you know, it really doesn't matter anymore. I've seen the promised land. He also says that we as a people will make it to the promised land. He ain't say we as a nation. He ain't say we as a species. He says we as a people. He, he was giving a speech in a Mason Hall, and he was giving it to a room full of black folks. And he said, we as a people will make it to the promised land. You're not listening. This guy who's running around talking about Dr. King's dream, the reason why they killed Dr. King when they killed Dr. King was because that was the last chance they were going to have for about four or five years, astrologically or else the consequences would have been drastically worse. That's why they killed him. If they had allowed him to keep going, the I have a dream that we know and we are forced to swallow today would have been overshadowed by the next dream speeches that Dr. King gave in 68, 69, and 70. That's why they killed him. One second. All right, so <clears throat> I I want to read for you because everyone likes to quote Dr. King and talk about I have a dream. People who've never actually read the speech. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I was saying that I had one that I had marked up. Here is that one that I marked up. Um. By the way, this is a, this this whole statement is impressive. I it's actually after I got done um, writing it up, I published it for everybody to um, to have access to online, so you can look this up and you can find it. <clears throat> so let me let me quote a little bit of this. The new era of abundance finds us not only with proliferating ghettos, but it finds us enmeshed in confused commitments in distorted values. Our confusion can be illustrated by an unanswered question. Are we more concerned with the size, power, and wealth of our society or with creating a more just society? The future to pursue the failure to pursue justice is not only a moral default. Without it, social tensions will grow and the recurring turbulence in the streets will persist 
despite disapproval or repressive action. Even more, a withered sense of justice is in, a, in an expanding society leads to corruption of the lives of all Americans. All too many of those who live in affluent America ignore those who exist in poor America. In doing so, the affluent Americans will eventually have to face themselves with the question that Eingman chose to ignore. How responsible am I for the well-being of my fellows? To ignore evil is to become an accomplice to it. Is there evil in America today? In the sense of the systemic physical extermination of a people, excuse me, uh, but in the sense of the destruction of hope, after the raising of expectations, the forced separation of the poor, whether black or white, from the rest of society, the confinement to poverty and squalor of millions of Americans, to be born a Negro in an American city for most of us means to be under the main stratum of our society, to be underemployed or unemployed or underpaid, to be undereducated and ill-housed, to face illness and perhaps death, undercared for, to face a life, I apologize guys, I'm trying to do this in his cadence, but it's difficult because of how they have this written. <clears throat> Again, um, to be born a Negro in an American city for most of us means to be under the main stratum of our society. It means to be underemployed or unemployed or, un or underpaid, to be undereducated and ill-housed, to face illness and perhaps death uncared for, to face a life of little hope entrapped by both color and need. American cities are not the city of God, not the city, are not the city of God, nor the city of man. They contain the resident, the residues of exploitation, of waste, of neglect, of indifference. The poor in the discriminated huddle in the big cities, the poor houses of the welfare state, while affluent Americans display or affluent America displays its new gadgets in the crisp homes of suburbia. Will we move to provide a moral balance in American life and give priority to the disinheriting or shall we continue our token attention? Now, how many of you, what does the, the dream that Dr. King was talking about with reading that gives it a whole new color? gives it a whole new color. And the fact that he says both black and white, again, it goes to the idea that to black folks, <clears throat> all lives matter. To white folks, that's the question. Because as he was talking about black and white poverty, white folks who are massively more affluent, who are living comfortable middle-class lives couldn't be bothered to fix either one of them. Despite the shift from agriculture to industry and the decline in the share of national income going to rent, interest, and dividends, the share of the economic pie going to the bottom 20% of American families has not changed since World War II. Mind you, he said the share of 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 the economic pie going to the bottom 20% of Americans had not changed since World War II. That was 20 years earlier. It was actually 21 years earlier. This is because of increasing inequality in wages. The heavy incidence <clears throat> of unemployment among Negroes and other minority groups and the failure of Social Security and welfare payments to keep up with the rising demands of society. The rising affluence of America has benefited the better off more than the poor and dis discriminated. 
our income record is acceptable only if we wish to tolerate a society in which the richest fifth of the population is ten times as rich as the poorest fifth, and in which the average Negro earns half as much as his white counterpart. There is a lot more here. I'm going to read one more section. I'm going to skip a section. The sorry record of income, public service, education, indicates that we are not doing enough. A major reason for our failures is that we aim too low. Our goal is not to bring the discriminated up to a limited particular level, but to reduce the gap between them and the rest of American society. As standards of life rise for affluent Americans, we cannot peg the poor at the old levels of subsistence. For example, the $3,000 poverty line set too low to begin with must not only be adjusted for changes in the cost of living, which in any case tend to underestimate the more rapid increase in the costs of the poor in the present inflationary period, but for changes in the average standard of living of all America. We are dealing with issues of inequality, of relative standing. This is true whether we have in mind the condition of cities in relation to, um, sorry guys, this is true whether we have in mind the condition of cities in relation to suburbs or the poor in relation to the rest of the society. One explanation of the poor educational results of Negro, of the Negro, and other center city, and other city center children alleges that there is something basically wrong with the educational capacities of these children. But how can we, the confident of this, or how can we be confident of this? when we have not given these youths an equal, equal opportunity at a decent education. Probably should have stopped one paragraph before that. Anyway, people talk about Dr. King's dream. They have no clue. You want to really read the reality of Dr. King's dream and, and what it was facing in the society? Read this. Um, <clears throat> it takes a while, but RFK does start, start to speak. There's also Senator Ribikoff, um, who um, was kind of uh, well known in his own time. But I was surprised when I started reading through this to see Senator Kennedy. Um, <clears throat> Dr. King, this is from Den Senator Kennedy. Dr. King, do you think that the degree of alienation among the youth is understood outside the ghettos, Dr. King. You mean understood by Senator Kennedy, those who live outside the ghetto, Dr. King. Which, by the way, this 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 whole exchange here helps you understand white people have been using the music industry to propagandize a certain image to suburban white America, keeping them massively conservative helping them to believe that um the problems in the ghetto are black people's problems and that if black people weren't so messed up they weren't so um incapable of doing anything then the problems would be fixed no lie these people have been literally using uh the pop culture as a weapon of mass assault against black folks Dr. King, I don't think so. Well, the problem of the ghetto, as you know, Senator Kennedy, is that ghetto dwellers are so often invisible. Their thoughts are unknown and their words are unheard and their feelings are unfelt. And I think all too many persons who live outside the ghetto are unaware of the deep despair and the deep frustration and the deep sense of alienation that many ghetto dwellers felt. And that many of the young people who were caught up in the problems of the ghetto and all the pathologies of the ghetto uh, to feel and experience every day. Like I said, they've been using your music to educate white people about black folks. And the music has been built deliberately to make us seem less human. Recognize that.
Questions, comments, concerns, guys, leave them below. I'll talk to you. Peace.